Okay, so thank you very much for that really uh, insightful talk and sort of, I suppose, in some ways general, but also digging down. And I'm very pleased that you've mentioned some of the foundations associated with some individuals here from the clans of Ireland. So I'm sure that went down quite well. Yeah, and I didn't know who was going to be here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was I was trying to make a mental note when you were all coming up. So we do yeah. apologise for yeah. any omissions yeah. in advance And I'm well. happy if you have questions about your own clan. I'll try. Don't put me too much on the spot, but I'll do my best. Indeed. So thank you very much for that. Um, perhaps a few aspects to pick up on um, initially, and then perhaps we can open it, open it out a bit wider for questions from the floor, and indeed questions online as well. So I'm quite interested, and this is going a little bit beyond the presentation today, but um, I'd be curious your remarks. Um, I'm quite interested in the social differentiation of late medieval Gaelic lordships. Yeah. So in particular, things such as uh, material culture mm, of the learned mm. and of the ruling elite, mm. as well as the church and yeah, other privileged yeah, groups, yeah. the Fili, the Shenachi yeah. and, and, and other ones. So aside from the obvious examples of mm. tower houses, mm. which were residences of the sort of landowning yeah. Gaelic elite, yeah. um, if we go one or two layers below that, mm. what what is the type of material culture, i.e. architecture, sure. but other things yeah. Yeah. like the corbs or the erknux, which which held missile shrines, for example? Mm. But what else is there? What what mm. what and what is the evidence for yeah. it? So this is one of the problems um, that. The average dwelling would have been made from ephemeral materials, um, depending on the region. And I mean, actually, I say that, I was about to say that they've all gone. I suspect they haven't all gone and that they're hiding in plain sight in some cases. I mentioned the poem about O'Kelly and the gathering of poets. And it actually talks about the smaller houses being made of wattle, um, so woven rods. And we know uh, that there was woodland management, that, you know, wattle and daub, continue to be used. And indeed, from some of the maps, the earliest maps that are made in Plantation Ulster, we can see uh, a type of house called a Crete, uh, which is essentially like a giant upside down basket. Uh, and, and this was something that actually you could, if you were, um, for example, bullying, if you were moving around with cattle herds, you could actually either, I suspect, bring them with you or you just put up another one. Um, so that would have been, you know, the, I suppose, the the lower orders of society, if you like, uh, but also, you know, crock built houses. So mm. we might be familiar, particularly, um, I don't know, somewhere at Germany, France, even parts of England still, where you would have, you'd still see timber beams, like typical Tudor, you know, half timber buildings. We know that was the type of building, for example, in Dublin City that everybody lived in. Um, also, I mean, actually right along the East Coast, because there isn't a good supply, easily quarried stone. Um, when you go further west, you had urban tower houses. So any of you familiar with Galway City, you can, if you look hard enough at some of the horrendous shop fronts, you'll see little bits of medieval uh, still yes, there. Yes. But I think in the countryside, it was whatever um, materials were available. So I think when you go to somewhere like Connemara, or um, I, I'd be very familiar with Sligo myself, and we renovated a cottage about 20 years ago and discovered you know, even though it was only a three-bed one, it had been thatched, made just out of field sticks, no mortar, just mud, and it had a mummified cat, uh, which had been placed over the door, which is a good luck symbol. Indeed. It's to keep the spirits out. They're 17th century, and I just wonder, that house might even have just been re-roofed then. Because actually, if you think about it, the vernacular housing hasn't changed, mm. you know, it really hasn't. So there may be some hiding in plain sight, but that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I think just to pick up yeah. on that point, that poem, which I think yeah. if I remember rightly is uh, Fili Erin Gohinchuk, yeah. yeah. um, all the poets of yeah. Ireland under one roof or yeah. in one house. Yeah. Um, it does talk about streets, if I remember, yeah, streets for right. musicians. It yeah, that's right. It's yeah. a designated yeah. streets for musicians, streets for the Fili, the poets, yes. streets for the yeah. Shenachi, yeah. the historians. Yeah. But that seems to be a temporary arrangement. That was, that was a, 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 I suppose, a, a, a cru nouveau, a, a great gathering. Yes. Um, yeah. But what you're yeah. referring to, yeah. though, is more, I suppose, sedentary, more longer-term yeah. I mean, habitations. Day-to-day day -day life, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's very hard. But you do, say, with some of the craft workers, masons in particular, uh, when you're scouring some of the documents, there are a number of them who are innkeepers as well. And then you think, well, why are they doing that? Mm. It's seasonal. So again, mm. they might have had a slightly bigger house where they're, you know, mm. or they run a pub and then their wife runs it while they're at mm. work and this kind of thing. But again, m built from whatever materials are around. The yeah. tires are much more, it's about a statement of, you know. 
just just well, on that sort of to... that aspect you touched on on hospitality. Yes. So of course in the annals we have a lot of yeah. attestations yeah. to guest housing. Again, yeah. often held by ecclesiastical yes. or learned families. Yes. Um, but also we see, and you referred to, um, I note, um, uh, Corkham Row Abbey here. Yeah, yeah. And when you park at Corkham Row Abbey, it's a fantastic site. And anybody here who hasn't been there, you need to go there. <laughs> um, and as you park to the, to the left-hand side, yeah. i.e. The, yeah. the south side of yeah. where the cloister was, there is a house yeah. or a building, I should say, yeah. which has been variously interpreted. But my interpretation would be, a guesting house, a ha yeah. um, hospitalium, yeah. Yeah. Um, where we have the word obviously hospital yeah. from, yeah. but a but a place of hospitality yeah. and, and yeah. a guest house. Yeah. Is there something in it about potentially looking at such remains where they're extant, mm -hmm. often in ecclesiastical mm -hmm. contexts, mm -hmm. and would that be something that may have mapped across to secular learned families also holding guesting houses? Would they be similar in that in that sort of architectural style? Because yeah. I remember that one has a pointed. Um, um, gothic um, yes. uh, yeah. doorway, yeah. maybe 15th yeah. century. Yeah. It's a stone built, maybe over yes. two levels. Um, but I'll be yeah. curious yeah. to yeah. get your views. Um, probably yes. Uh, the difficulty is again, it's it's a subject of study that's actually there's a recent book on learned families in the landscape, Liz, uh, Liz Fitzpatrick, mm -hmm. um, and she she excavated the O'Davern, um, I think. Uh, uh, Culture Brock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fantastic book. Yes, yeah. indeed. So again, long rectangular building but that's the problem i mean if we think what are archaeologists going to make of places we live you know in, in 500 years mm. it's very hard unless you actually find the material evidence to go with it so you know they were working with vellum and, and inks which don't tend to survive so how can we prove that this was where particular activities took place yes. so it, it can be tricky mm. also i mean i think with the guest houses attached to monasteries certainly that was part of its part of the Benedictine rule, which many of them adopted, that you have to give um, accommodation to travellers and so on. And that was part of the function of them, um, whether it's merchants or just people travelling around the country. But a number of patrons also kept a private hall at a monastery, mm. interestingly. Uh, so, for example, the Earls of Kildare had one on what is now Trinity at, at All Hallows. Um, the Earls of Ormond had one in Clamell Friary, known as the Earls Hall. And it was something that if they had um, friends coming over, they'd literally stay. But the friars maintained it and then mm. serviced it. Mm. So these buildings were multifunctional. Um, but in terms, I mean, uh, Obviously, there were scriptoria in some of the friaries. Yes. So the learned, so for example, at Kilcray Friary, uh, McCarthy Foundation. Down just in, out of Cork, west of Cork. Yeah, Cork, yeah. yes, just yeah. outside of Cork. Yes. They build their castle and then they build Kilcray. Yes. And Kilcray uh, produced a number of very fine um, illuminated manuscripts. There's one in Rang in France, mm. uh, which is, uh, it, it has it's the story of John, uh, Sir, the knight Sir John Mandeville, and it's traveling yeah. to far flung places and so on. Mm. But we know that that was made in the scriptorium at Kilcray, and it's a very well-lit space. Mm. So we can tell from things like windows, but it's very hard otherwise to reconstruct without you know, a lot of expense for archaeology. And that's mm. the other problem that in Ireland, archaeology tends to be uh, development-driven um, rather than research-driven. So if you're building a motorway, Mm. ground you can excavate it all mm. but if, you, if you're just curious the, mm. it, it costs a lot of money so yeah thank you for that um yeah. so you've touched on the sort of gaelic elite and mm -hmm. through the presentation yeah. the uh Iconaha or the o'connors of yeah. connor yeah. the Ivreen of tomond and, and elsewhere so if we go down just perhaps one level and often i think it's somewhat ignored or, or, yeah. or sort of passed over in analysis but quite importantly there's these other lordships which there was a, a, a real proliferation, mm. particularly, I think, mm. in the 15th century of yes. tower house yes. development. Yeah. Um, our next speaker, uh, Rishdaro yeah. Cronin, who's in the audience here, will probably touch on elements of this. Yeah. But if we took, for example, East Clare, I think, yes. and also yeah. similarly, you yeah. mentioned yeah. the lordship of Ivana as yeah. well, the, the O'Kellys. Yeah. But in, in East Clare in particular, we have the yeah. Maconmara, the McNamaras, yeah. Yeah. which over the 15th century, according yeah. to the uh, antiquary uh, Westrop, um, constructed over 60 tower yeah. houses in yeah. a fairly tight knit sure. um, lordship. Yeah. And are we seeing evidence of that elsewhere and what potential in other lordships, but what potentially would be the drivers for that? Okay. Um, there is an uneven uh, distribution of tower houses. So as you say, East Clare, Limerick, full of them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Des sort of Desmond, extended Desmond mm. uh, territory. Also the 
um, Earls of Ormond in mm. Tipperary, Kilkenny. And one of, I mean, we don't know for sure, but the part of the thinking is that you only really start to build tower houses when you know that you're secure. So it's, you know, let's say you buy a plot of land and you're hoping to God you'll get the planning permission, but you don't start building until you get the planning permission and you know the land is yours. And, mm. and there's, um, you know, we tend to think of them as defensive buildings and therefore being built, you know, to ward off. But actually, they're probably a symbol of uh, a better economy because there is better economic stability in a particular area. So one of the theories about that kind of distribution pattern um, is tied into the larger um, earl, earldoms or um, of the time of Desmond and Ormond, and I suppose the cadet branches, and then all of the other families that are living there, where they say, okay, these guys have it under control. We, we're good. We can kind of establish ourselves here mm. and work in that way. And similarly with the O'Donnells, actually in Tyrconnell, with the Mac Awards, the Sweeney's, so on. Mm. Um, and, you know, they then start to build their tower houses into, you know, um, smaller bits of um, patronage, but often patronage that copies the, the, I suppose, the higher up uh, lords as well. So we get this flourishing of the making of reliquary shrines in Ulster uh, in the 15th and 16th century, nowhere else, but it's following the lead of the O'Donnells who have the cock and, mm, mm, and then indeed. suddenly you get other families, you know, mm. enshrining uh, relics at the time. So it's very interesting. Yeah. So I think that um, interrelationship, if yeah. we could, may term it, between the Gaelic elite um, and, and, and also the church, mm. and you touched on the Franciscan friaries, yes. and I think the expansion, particularly the observant Franciscans, yes. um, the Franciscans come to Ireland in the 13th century. I think, I think one example will be Ennis Friary from maybe 1240 or yep. something like that, where it was founded. And then <laughs> by the 15th century, you see a real expansion um, and this nexus, mm -hmm. this rela close relationship between the Gaelic elites. Yeah. So often where you find a tower house, you find, right. or, or, or yeah, a centre of a yeah, lordship, yeah. you find a Franciscan yeah, friary as yeah, well. Yeah. You might speak to that a little bit as well, yeah. please. That is a really interesting thing because it happens nowhere else in Europe, mm. just here. Mm. Typically, um, Dominicans, the mendicant towards Dominican Franciscans, Augustinians, Carmelites, were all um, ma mainly established in countries by the end of the 13th century. You had a few later foundations. And typically in Ireland, actually, when they're first introduced, they are introduced as part of the social control of colonialism. Uh, the rule is they have to be staffed by English friars. We tend to think of them as friendly Gaelic, you know, but they were English friars. And again, you'd have the great Norman castle and then the friar. So any of the new towns, if you think, say, of Sligo, for example, which is an Anglo-Norman town, you have the Fitzgerald Castle at one end of the town and the friary at the other. So it's looking down on the townspeople. With the Gaelic resurgence, let's call it that, in mm. the late 14th into the 15th century, um, they use the same strategy, but we're not quite sure whether the intention was you build your tower house, you build your friary, and then they will come <laughs> and you'd have a settlement between the two because it's this curious thing, we have rural friaries. And that's... An anomaly because mm. the whole point of them is that they're providing pastoral care, they're preaching, um, they're providing um, infirmaries, hostelries, all this kind of thing, and yet they're in the middle of nowhere. So it's I think it's more down to trade, which is you know what I was saying mm. earlier. It's about it's exerting social control in a slightly different way because mm. they're flexible. They have mm. these huge buildings and they're providing multiple functions. Mm. I should say that Ennis, because Brian is in the front row, is one of the few early foundations by. Uh, Gaelic uh, Lord, rather than most of the early ones are all Anglo Norman. Yes. And Ennis, I think the town did follow, didn't it? I mean, the, the friary was established, and that's a very unusual. It's typically, you know, you're, the town is there and you're putting yes. one at either end. I think, and we were speaking prior mm. to the lecture here, Quinn Friary yeah. is a very interesting yeah. example whereby, founded by the McNamaras, to, to go back to that yeah. sort of East Clare lordship yeah. in 1402, I think Sheeta McNamara yeah. was the yeah. founder. Yeah. And as according to the annals for a mausoleum for his family, right. prior to that, yeah. the McNamara has been buried yeah. next to the Ivry and the O'Briens yeah. in Ennis. Ennis yeah. But what's interesting with that friary is in the 1586 Inquisition of Sean McMorra Fion, mm -hmm. um, it mentions the various lands and 22 tenements yeah. next to, which is actually in the adjacent field of, yes. Quinn Friary itself. Yes. Yeah. And if one just does a simple Google search and looks down on Google yeah. Satellite, um, one can see the, the sort of remains of foundation of all yeah. these structures yeah. 
in the field yeah. just adjacent to the friary. Yeah. So I think to your earlier point, yeah. sort of almost proto-urban uh, development. That's right. Right yeah. next to yeah. the friary. And sometimes there is evidence of that. I mean, it's uh, we did some geophysical surveying at Moyne because I was sure there had mm. to be a town there. Nothing. Not mm. a thing. Now, maybe that's because, you know, they were using wattle. They were using earth. And this is the problem. You just so don't know. Organic but, materials which yeah, don't show. But it should have been a bustling harbour. And yes. there's no sign of it whatsoever. Yes. So it's interesting. But Quinn, again, if you haven't been, go. It's a fantastic site. And it is, it's really interesting. This idea, I think, which I love about Irish architecture, of the palimpsest, where you layer, you know, there's one layer over another, over another. Like I was mentioning in Galway, if you stare at the ugly shop front long enough, you'll see a little medieval face peeking out at you. Mm. A Quinn, absolutely right, when the friar was founded, it was actually founded on the site of an earlier castle, an Anglo-Norman castle, That's which right, possibly yeah. had never been finished. Hmm. And it's it's bang on the footprint. It's amazing. So when you look at the plan, it's got these strange corner towers that belong to the earlier castle. Yes. And it's almost like, you know, saying, ha, we, we own this now and plonking their friary down on top oh, of Oh, I it. think it's absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's all yeah. about, I think, yeah. as I would term it, McNamara bling. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. a huge yeah. foundation yeah. for yeah. these observant Franciscans yeah. Um, enormous yeah. foundation, Absolutely. and indeed, I think yeah. very symbolic that it's founded on the ruins of Absolutely. Thomas de Clare's castle, yes. yeah. um, and yeah. during that yeah. period of resurgence. Yeah. 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 Is that something when we're looking at um, just more generally yeah. art and architecture yeah. in Gaelic Island? Should we should we be looking at it through the prism of status, through the prism of Gaelic resurgence yeah. of the late 14th, 15th century? Yeah. Would that be one way to interpret this? I think this? so, and I think a lot of it is status-driven. I mean, human nature doesn't change that much. Nouveau riche, you know, if you're up and coming, you yes. want the you want the bling. But I think what's very interesting is the, the idea of identity that you touched on there, because um, earlier when you were asking about, you know, what might we have seen, let's say, in a banqueting hall or what kind of decoration, um, I've recently been doing some work on the links between Gaelic Scotland and Ireland with a colleague in Edinburgh. And what's very interesting is we have what, has been termed Gaelic revival. So when I was showing you, for example, that wonderful manuscript of the O'Kellys, the Book of Yvrinia, um, in this kind of Book of Kelsey style almost, um, that is something that you only find associated with very particular objects. So you find it with these hereditary status objects. Mm. So um, hereditary manuscripts, which is what these were commissioned to be, reliquary shrines, um, where else do you get it? Uh, oh, yeah, armor. More of them surviving in Scotland, but um, a targe, which is the Highland shield, mm. uh, stamped leather. They typically have interlaced designs on them. Also the dirge, which is a, a mm. typical Gaelic uh, mm. dagger. They also have, and in Scotland, I'm sure they must have been here as well, whalebone caskets. We don't know what they were used for, but they are featured on some of the tomb effigies. So they were clearly a status symbol of mm. lairds and probably lords here. As you landed gentry, and these are the symbols of, and actually also in dress, they revive the ancient dress. So Art McMurray Kavanagh, there's a famous French illustration of him. Yes, I know it, yes. Bare feet with gold spurs on your ankles. <laughs> but is that, is that not just a literary um, Apparently, version, or do you no, think that actually, actually had a happened. real manifestation? They, they, because we have accounts of the, um, the uh, they revived the ancient inauguration ceremonies using relics for the, as part of the inauguration. Mm. And there are accounts, so Catherine Sims has done a lot of work on this, of accounts of they actually adopted this dress. So no stirrups on the horses and mm. this very bizarre and short, uh, whatever, I can't, I can't remember the term for it, but not, you know, quite... They're, they're above the knee, basically. I, I think if I yeah. remember correctly, she quotes, is, was it not a Hungarian knight who visits Loch Derg on right. pilgrimage yes. in about yeah, 1397? Yeah, yeah. Which may be slightly propagandist, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, there are... But he makes these observations yeah, himself right. yeah, yeah. as regards Absolutely. the um, yeah. email. Yeah. Um, so one last question, yeah. and we might then take a question or two from the audience, but it's really to your point about um, Gaelic Scotland. Yeah. I was going to say, in terms of built heritage of Gaelic Ireland, mm -hmm. what can we learn from Gaelic Scotland? And I have in my mind, there's quite a few kindreds who yes, migrate from Scotland exactly. yeah, to yeah. Ireland and yeah. uh, some yeah. who go from Ireland to Scotland yeah. indeed. But if we look at the ones from Gaelic Scotland to Ireland, um, probably one of the um, uh, best known perhaps is the McSwivna or the McSweenies. Yes, yeah. And of course we have Castle yeah. Sween where they're yeah. meant to hail from yeah. um, in Argyll in yeah. Southwest Scotland. Yeah. And then they sort of proliferate themselves down the western seaboard of Ireland, mm -hmm. and we have various mm -hmm. castles yeah. constructed by the yeah. McSweenies. So if we look at those types of kindreds yeah. who have roots in Gaelic Scotland, is there any kind of con um, um, congruence, um, sure. congruence yeah, between yeah. the two? Um, 
in ways surprisingly little, Colin Breen has argued that there are commonalities in the design of the tire houses, but they're very subtle and I don't think they're powerful enough to say definitively. The one thing that we do have, though, is a clear influence of um, the Highland School of Sculpture. It's this very distinctive mm. Mm. Um, form of sculpture that you find in the Highlands and Islands that, again, is slightly revivalist. It has interlaced and, and uh, often has effigies of gallow glasses, of gallons as well. Yes. Um, and you see elements of that, say, at Doe Castle, one of mm. the, uh, again, one of the Swivna castles. There is a, a tombstone there, very similar in style. Another one now in Killybegs, which is from Ballysaget, which was, again, a foundation of theirs. And one at uh, Klunka, Kloncha, I think it's Kloncha, it's pronounced Klonka, mm -hmm. it's written in Donegal, which actually they think was shipped over from Scotland and mm -hmm. used there. We don't know who who's, well, it has, it's, it's dedicated to Magnus McArston, which is clearly a Scot. Mm -hmm. However, we think it's been recycled and was possibly mm -hmm. used for one of the Scots Gaelic families or uh, there. But other than that, uh, Dungiven Priory, there's some evidence of uh, influence coming from my owner in the, That's the tomb Ocahans, sculpture. That's the Ocahans, isn't it? The yes. yeah. yeah. I know myself from yeah. um, um, walking around the graveyard of Kilmartin yes. uh, in Cross. Argyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. High crosses, yeah. but also yeah. um, there's a whole lot of that sort of Western sculpture, right. gallo yeah. glee or gallo yeah. glass yeah. Yeah. Um, right. individuals. And yeah. you do see yeah. some of that replicated perhaps yeah. in Ireland, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. more from a sculptural perspective, yes. as you said, yeah. rather than yeah. perhaps yeah. a built yeah. heritage yeah. like Again, you know, things like we know harpists were going backwards and forwards, and actually harps are another mm. thing that tends to have that Gaelic revival. There are so few of them that survive, but the Queen Mary harp in Scotland, very similar to the Brian Brew, so-called mm. harp in Trinity. So, yeah. Again, I think it's the ephemeral things that was probably much greater um, parallel, but we're all we're left with is the stone a lot of the time. So. And of course, we have bardic poetry in the manuscript. Yes, of um, course, yeah. very, very similar, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we might have time perhaps for one question. <laughs> I know we're pushing up against the clock. Um, just down, Mr. O'Donnell down the uh, back here. Thank you very much um, for um, mentioning the Donegal connections. <laughs> I had to. When I heard uh, your just name. a quick comment and then a small query. Yeah. Um, uh, this is the 550th anniversary of the erection of Donegal Castle and of the foundation of Donegal Abbey yeah. by Eirua the I, mm -hmm. Eirua the I, who passed away in 1505. Yeah. And apparently, according to some Franciscan records, he and his wife, O'Connor Faley, who brought the Franciscans mm -hmm. to uh, Donegal, are buried in a crypt in Donegal Abbey. But I haven't found anything yeah. Uh, yeah. archaeologically yeah. about a crypt, and I'm wondering if that's something that you would know something about. And yeah. the second thing is just simply in parenthesis on that, that uh, the O'Donnells initially were based in Ballyshannon with a Cistercian Abbey Asero. at Asero. Yeah. Yeah. And it was possibly when Eirua built Donegal Castle and the foundation of the Abbey there that the patronage, uh, the religious patronage switched to the Franciscans from the Cistercians. And then the, other, the query would be, have you looked into the question of ownership with the system of ownership in this country, the estate and titles, et cetera, as a factor in the preservation of our historical monuments? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try and do those in order. So the crypt, um, undoubtedly, that's where they're buried. I'd say there's no question. Founders were always, and that was, would have been built as a, a mausoleum for the adults. So they're there, but they'll be underground somewhere. There may be an actual crypt, but they might... Typically, they're buried on the north side of the chancel. So if you're going to dig, that's where to go. Um, the Asaro, uh, to, uh, yeah, you're right. I think the Franciscan, it does switch. And they found numerous third order ones as well. And interestingly, if you look very closely at the shrine of the Cahoc, which was their great relic, there's a tiny engraved figure of St. Francis, which I think helps to date when they actually encased it. So that's down on display, actually, in the museum. Then land ownership. Um, I haven't, that's a huge undertaking, uh, and so I haven't in any great detail, but I think in terms of preservation, one of the things I think it's, it's at the time of, um, obviously the 17th century is pivotal, and it's really down to what happens in the 17th century to a particular territory as to how well preserved. So if you look at Ulster, for example, um, very poor survival rates of medieval architecture because of the plantations, whereas in other parts of the country, even say Leash Offaly, 
the planters actually occupied the tower houses and they occupied the churches, so that helped to preserve them. Um, so it, it's very regionally specific and often down to a family managing to hang on or not as to whether or not things were preserved. But by and large, it's the Gaelic areas where things survived the best, particularly the churches, because they continued and indeed still continue to be the burial places of the founder families. So there's a fabulous tradition there. Yeah, indeed. I think there was one very quick, but just one question, please. Yes. No, no, go ahead. Or Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. It's more of a plug than a than a question, really. <laughs> but uh, the the on the general um, point about illuminated manuscripts and the things you're talking about yesterday, the continuity of Christian culture, but also this uh, divergence, as it appears in Ireland, innovation on it. Yeah. Um, I, but particularly for people online. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moss, for your, your talk, but uh, Rachel Moss is listed as one of two academics in an online course uh, by FutureLearn on uh, the Book of Kells as Illuminated Manuscript. It's a four-week course, four hours a week, and it's free, and um, it covers a lot of discussing about here today and over 38 and a half thousand people have done that course yeah. and I think it's a wonderful Just job. Just Google done. Kel's course online and you'll find it. Okay I think we might wrap it up there so thank you very much Dr Moss. Just one quick. You, you mentioned uh, the, the monks would typically be English. Well, uh, were they English in, in the sense of, or more Anglo-Norman? Yeah. Okay, so originally, um, it depends on the founder. So obviously, Melifont, they were our, um, they were French, actually, they're coming over. But when the Anglo-Normans came, they used the religious order as part of the colonizing process. So there they would actually have brought from, whether it's Wales, whether it's, but they had to be of English birth. When you ask, it's the subtle, I suppose. Uh, obviously, um, in future generations, what would happen is they had to come from an English town. So, you know, if you were born in Dublin, you were seen as being English and that was okay. But if you were from the wilds of Kerry, no, you were Gaelic, so you couldn't. So that's how it worked. With the newer foundations then, they were Gaelic. So uh, that kind of died out. Great. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>